Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a very special episode of Benefits Buzz. I'm your host, Eric Piella, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Kelsey Burgad. Hi, everybody. Kelsey, I couldn't be any more excited. You know how I get. Uh, you love being on stage, and I am more of the behind the Google Meet person. So when he said, let's do this live, I'm like, let's do this. Yeah, great you know? idea, Eric. Well, we are live. For those of you listening, so there's, th what happens is there's a lot of words that get thrown out and are, and are used too often, like the word epic. Like my seven-year-old came home from school and said, Dad, we had lime jello for lunch. It was epic. And in four seasons of Benefits Buzz, we've never used the word epic to describe an episode. Are you but sure? I, I don't think we have. I said phenomenal, amazing, but yeah. I feel like epic is like the unprecedented. Unprecedented, yeah, yeah, we say that a lot. Yeah. And this, pivot. Epic is like the upper <laughs> echelon. And I think I'm finally ready to say this is going to be an epic episode for a couple of reasons, and I've got three of them. First, this is a special HSA Day episode of Benefits Buzz. And it's also, again, the final cap season, uh, episode of season four. We had over 30 episodes this season. A lot of time together. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. And HSA Day. Let's give them a quick overview of what HSA Day is. Yeah, you know, we set out to create HSA Day, and it's really about spreading awareness of what HSAs are. You know, health savings accounts can bring so much value to so many people, but they're not very well known and very understood. So we came up with an awesome theme, I think, of Change the HR Story. Absolutely. So it's HSA Day, number one. Number two, for the first time ever in Four Seasons, we are doing this podcast in front of a live audience in beautiful downtown Fargo. Make some noise. For those of you who are listening, you're probably confused. Go check out the video version of this on our website and our YouTube channel. It's going to be fantastic. That's number two. And number three, we have some of the most amazing guests we have ever had. Now, each of these guests individually would for sure be a seasoned stealer, Absolutely. but we have all three at once, and so I want to introduce our guests right now. All right, to my left, we have Mr. Johnny C. Taylor. Johnny C. Taylor is the president and CEO of SHRM. He's the uh, best-selling author of a brand new book called Reset. Yes. yes, and Johnny, we are so pumped to have you on our show today. Absolutely. <laughs> Epic guest number one. Epic guest number two, we have Jennifer McClure. Jennifer McClure is the CEO of Disrupt HR and Unbridled Talent. Jennifer, you are, are a huge on the speaking market. I know you spoke at uh, hundreds of events, and we're so excited for you to speak and be a part of this podcast. So welcome. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, we round out our trio of guests, epic guests. We have Stephanie O'Connell Rodriguez. Welcome to the show. Stephanie is a national renowned uh, millennial money expert. She is a best-selling author as well, and she is also a podcast host. So she hosts the Money Confidential podcast, which is part of Real Simple's uh, brand umbrella. So Stephanie, welcome to Benefits Buzz podcast. So after you find Benefits Buzz, make sure you go check out hers and subscribe to hers as well. Absolutely. Benefits Buzz, then yes. Money Confidential. One, two. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm being judged by the podcast host that's also up here. No, well, never. never. Never, never. Well, let's jump in. Well, there's a reason we have you here today. Um, and I think um, we, we talked about HSA Day. We talked about what we want to talk, um, specifically when it comes to HR professionals. Um, and we kind of had this, this idea that employers, HR professionals, they face what we kind of call this revolving door of questions. And we actually kind of made a fun little uh, video ad about it. Really, right, when your door, when someone knocks on your door, you get an IM as an HR pro, you don't know if it's going to be about benefits. You don't know if it's going to be about, um, you know, some awkward question about someone complaining about someone else. If it's going to be like, hey, there's a problem in the bathroom, can you help? Like, literally everything's on the table for poor HR professionals. None of months is being a benefits guru. And, and so we wanted to be like, how can we make at least one part of your job really, really easy? So yeah. that's why we wanted to have this podcast to talk about how benefits can be something that you just know, top of your mind, address it, and kill those questions. Yeah, we saw a great post on Sherm's LinkedIn, Johnny. Okay. <laughs> and it was like, tell us you're in HR without telling us you're in HR. And there was a common theme. And it was that HR gets so many different questions throughout the day. And it's so hard to actually get the work done that you want to get done. To Jessica's point earlier, you know, strategize about what you want to do. Um, so we set out to, like Eric said, solve one problem, and that's benefits education. So we're trying to change the HR story when it comes to benefits education around HSAs. 
Well said, Kelsey. Can't help but toilet paper. <laughs> no, we can't help you there. So um, as always with our podcast, we have a great producer who loves to pull all the great data for us to kind of set the environment and stage before I get into this first question. So a couple of things that he said. We, we, we talk about the challenges that face. We've got right a point, we talked about the great resignation, right? Just in April, a record of 4 million Americans are quitting their jobs, right? And I think that's just kind of catapulting and going and going and all, everyone's nodding their heads in the audience and then up here too, right? So on, on, on top of that, on average, an employee only spends 18 minutes enrolling in their benefits. And we like to joke, like literally that's the time it takes to make a pizza or to find your next Netflix show you wanna binge watch, right? It's not a lot of time. And so, um, right, so you have all this chaos that's happening. You've got people who really aren't paying tons of attention to a, what is a very, very important decision, right? And so we wanted to call attention to that. And so the first thing I wanna do is I wanna ask you, again, a broad question about, from your perspective, you each come up with a different perspective, about how you've seen this great resignation impact the HR world and the HR strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll jump in here. There you go, John. You know, chivalry is not dead. I tried, <laughs> right? I tried my best. Like you mentioned before, and I know the term unprecedented, it's mm -hmm. like legit. It We've helps. never quite seen anything like this. I have people coming in and hear stories, listen, in my own shop, like I'm supposed to be Mr. HR. We run Sherm, and they're coming <laughs> in and saying, like, I'm out. The people across the street offered me 30% more. And not for promotion, but like for the same job, right. you know? Depending on how good they are, I'm like, good. <laughs> They're overpaying. <laughs> um, no, seriously. But uh, <laughs> I'm nuts. But uh, no, seriously, yeah. what we're learning, though, and the biggest is people don't understand their benefits. Mm. So that's why what you all are doing is so important. Like, they kind of understand you're paying me fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. They got that number. Right. But they don't fully, fully appreciate the full cost of hiring them. And so the more education we can do, the better. We found that that is helping us retain employees in this turnstile, right? right? Just making them understand, you know, if you leave me for X, what you're trading off. So you go across the street for 2,500 bucks more, but you have this benefit right. offering that would have, it, it's really four or $5,000 more in value to you. They just don't know. Yeah, I think as HR leaders, we've been caught up in the system for so many years of the value exchange. We have a job, you come in, we pay you, you do work. Where the last year and a half, 18 months or so, I think has caused everyone to approach work differently. And so now it's much more about where can I be my best self and where can I have the most of my well-being? And so HR leaders are now having to look at how do we offer a whole self experience Benefits is a piece of that, pay is a piece of that, the work environment, but we've got to be thinking more about well-being, and that's a little bit of a mind shift, I think, for HR leaders. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So I don't work in HR, but I interview people about their money and what that experience looks like in the day-to-day. And so I'm coming at this from the perspective of the people who are maybe shopping around for a different job, maybe assessing the value of their benefits. And what I consistently find is there is a disconnect between the day-to-day -day experience of the employee and the way the employer understands that person's experience. So quick example, one of my girlfriends has a young son who is in a childcare that has been shut down three times in the last month. Understanding that what she needs is an employer who can accommodate that. It's not that she doesn't want to work. It's that she needs to be able to have the flexibility to accommodate what's happening on the ground. And I think that holds true across the spectrum of experience when I talk to people on the show. I love that example. Thank you for bringing that to light as well, right? It's good to have different perspectives. Hey, it's a live podcast. And it's, it's raining. And it's raining. They always say, have an HSA for a rainy day fund. This is the literal, the literal rainy way of that. Thank you for huddling up. So let's, you mentioned, you talked about benefits, and I love that you went there. We are creeping on open enrollment. Yes. So we are in open enrollment season. How do you see that impacting open enrollment and the way people are evaluating their benefits? So in a way that we've never done before, I hear employers all over focusing on it. You know, it was kind of, to your point, transactional. Open enrollment, you come in, you spend 10, 12 minutes, and you know, you hit every, I'm gonna, I want everything I had last year. Like, they right. never really understood their benefits. We're going to make our employees understand it. We're gonna say pause, and this is not simply, 
I want everything I had before, you can actually understand it. It's a little painful, but by the way, from an HR practitioner standpoint, I don't want you signing up for something and then coming in the next week and saying, I need this. And I'm like, well, you signed up for that. <laughs> right. You know, we're supposed to hire smart people here and I'm questioning <laughs> it right now. You know, you just went through open enrollment and signed up for something or left benefits on the table that were relevant to you. I can't wait till we really get to talk about HSAs because it's a classic example of something that is so underutilized and we as companies offer it, but for some reason employees don't take full advantage of it. So how do we do that, Johnny? How do we get them to spend more time and maybe not even more time, but better utilize their time? Or how do HR pros really get in front of them to say, hey, these are your benefits. We need you to better understand these because you're getting the value out of it, and so is HR. So I'm going to say something that might be counterintuitive. We're going to have to go old school. You know how Walmart or those companies do the rollback? We have, in the spirit of being so expedient, we have literally allowed people to go on and just renew their benefits without thinking about it. So we're going to slow them down now. Mm. Companies are saying, listen, you're going to go to a session. It might be virtually, so you don't have to go down to some office with 100 other people. But you're going to sit down and you're going to understand these benefits because we're spending a lot of money for it. And I do this with my daughter right now. You know, she takes things for granted. I'm like, no, no, no. We're going to take our time and understand what daddy has to do to pay for these benefits so that she, and I don't mean literally, but benefits to her, <laughs> yeah. right? Because people take it for granted. They just do. So literally, we're seeing more and more companies say, we're going to make you take 30 minutes out of your day, not the 18 <laughs> minutes that yep. you might just rush through and do it. And you're going to understand what we're spending a lot of money on. That's great. I just want to jump in on that because I think it's another great example of the disconnect I was just talking about is oftentimes we're like, oh my gosh, what I'm getting here is this incredible healthcare benefit, but it comes in the form of fine print on a piece of paper. And I don't know about you guys, I love my American Express, but I don't know the last time I read that card agreement. Right. You know, they're like, we got all these perks for you, and I write about money full time, but I'm not going to sit there and read 20 pages of fine print, no matter what they're telling me I just received. And it's the same thing with the HSA and all of the other benefits. It's how are we delivering this information? And in my rule is, how can we meet people where they are? And when it comes to money, it's really hard because there's a lot of taboo, there's a lot of discomfort. But where are people comfortable? I meet them on Instagram. That's where my audience is. So how can I let them know the value of this, where they're already spending time and they know how to engage and where they are willing and able to engage with content in a way that they don't shut down before they realize the full value because those 20 pages of fine print are not going to do it. I love that. I have to acknowledge how brave our audience is during this torrential <laughs> downpour. Thank you for listening. So you, you talked about, hey, I want to slow you down a little bit because my next question was going to be on how do we maximize that 18. We might not be able to get more unless we put in places to slow down that process. But if we only have 18 minutes, how do we maximize the time that we do have with them so that they really do understand the benefits and the choices that they have. Any suggestions there? Yeah, well, this is the financial expert, because I'm going to jump in after you. I'm a lawyer, so I can tell you how to solve that. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I think you got to meet them where they are, to your point. And I think we also brought up another idea of this is a hybrid experience. It's not a single one and done item. I always say money is a practice. And part of that practice for me and for what I tell my listeners is revisiting. It's not that I set up my 401k contribution the one time because if I got a raise, oh, I need to revisit that. Oh, maybe now I can contribute to an HSA as well because I have some disposable income. So I think it's really about not just meeting people where they are, but also recognizing that everybody engages in a different way. For some people, they're going to be in the spreadsheets and in that paperwork. They're going to love it. But some people might need to have that in-person conversation with you. And some people might need to be online. Or maybe for somebody, it's bringing in somebody who they can relate to to talk about it because, you know, you're in HR, you don't really get me, you're an HR person, right? It's kind of like alien. That's not true, HR people, <laughs> by the way. By the way, we relate to everyone, yeah, right? Of course it's not true, but I'm just saying this disconnect, this disconnect is just something I think we need to be aware of when we're having this dialogue. You know, the other thing that we found is we wait until open enrollment season. It's one week a year. Why not do this all year long? This is like where the big result, but the big reveal is this one week. 
But what about along the year digestible sort of nuggets? Like this is how HSAs work in February. And then we bring it back to them in five minute nuggets sure. in May. Like people need repetition. We know that the old, you know, you're the media person, but you know in media, you got to say it seven times for people to remember it. So thinking that we're just going to deliver it one time in this long piece of doc this document, you're right, it's not working. I think it's, you know, with everything that's happened over the last couple of years, we've experienced a lot of disruption. And I know a lot of HR leaders have been disrupted. I know when I worked in HR, you didn't look forward to open enrollment because it was a series of long meetings. You're saying the same things over and over again. And then a big period of Q&A afterwards and then rushing people to the deadline to complete their paperwork. I hope and I believe that HR leaders are looking at it different this year. And they're thinking about how do we make it allow where people are learning today. They're learning in bite-sized nuggets. They're learning in TikTok style videos. They're learning in entertaining ways. And so the HR leaders who are really looking at how can we make learning and development part of our annual open enrollments benefits, benefits education oh. and really kind of modeling what we do off of that instead of the traditional annual open enrollment meetings, that's where they're gonna get real benefit. One other little thing we see a lot of now is gamification. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. not just enough to provide the information. You've got to give people, you know, $5 off if you do this, or you win points for, you know, prizes. We have to meet people literally where they are, make this relevant. But here's something I want us to be careful about. We talk about online. We, for the first time in American history, we have five generations in the workplace at one time. So we can't over-index with focusing on young people, Madam Millennial and Generation Z, and forget that we got a lot of middle-aged people who those benefits matter to. And we've got to communicate with them as well. So it's sort of multi-factored sort of approach to solving this problem. My mother conceives benefits very differently than my younger brother. That's a great example and such great tips for people to think about all these different ways and avenues that you can reach the people in your organization with the benefits. But I want to know, I know both of you in particular spend a ton of time with HR or with employees and HR professionals. What specific success stories have you seen where they have tried maybe a new tactic like gamification? And have you seen or have they seen anything specific, tangible come out of that as far as statistics about employees actually understanding better? I haven't seen anything specific because I haven't met a lot of HR leaders who've been brave enough to try it. I facilitate an executive roundtable of CHROs and executive leaders. And again, they're approaching open enrollment similar to how they have in the past. And I'm really pushing them to think differently. So I don't have any good examples for you. Maybe after this year's annual open enrollment, we will. Because again, I think we've all been disrupted. We've all seen that people are learning in bite-sized nuggets, that they're learning in online course format. And it's not so much about even a virtual Zoom meeting for open enrollments. How can we think differently? So I, I don't have that, an example, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I, I'd agree. I think the problem is prior to sort of 2018, it really was a buyer's market. And so we didn't put a lot of time into it because we were selecting people, they weren't selecting us. But now that we are in more of a seller's market, it's forcing us to be more thoughtful, more intentional, and not just check the box, the open enrollment week that we all dread, right? It's really being intentional about it. So I think we're gonna see a lot of innovation this cycle. And then frankly, one, some of the lemonade from the lemon called you know, COVID and her sisters, right? Or cousins or whatever mm -hmm. you call them, Delta, Lambda, <laughs> Mu, right? <laughs> right? We are now having the opportunity to test, right? We're figuring what works for people who are working virtually. What works for people who are working in the office? Like we're, we're forced to innovate in ways that we haven't done ever. I definitely see that. I, I, I love that this as a landscape for where we're going. What I want to kind of start diving into more is this concept of health and wealth, especially around open enrollment, uh, as I'm subtly starting to work our way towards HSA day, wink, wink, right? So when we think about this, again, my producer pulled some interesting stats. It says, one study finds the top issues addressed through financial wellness initiatives were healthcare and retirement preparedness. And another one, employee financial wellness and stress has big impact on our workforce. 54% of employees say financial stress has caused them to either miss work, right, or negatively affected their productivity. So obviously financial well-being is an important part of a successful employee, a happy employee, and one that we retain, right? 
So let's talk about how benefits can start when we talk about our health, but also about our wealth. And so that's kind of our transition point. So my question to start that part of our conversation is, are health and wealth being positioned correctly to employees in the, in, during open enrollment? Is this something we're even talking to? Or is this something we're just kind of glazing over? We obviously know, choose your enrollments, about your health care. But is, is, is the wealth component addressed enough right now? I think we approach it in a piecemeal fashion. Like this benefit is a tax savings benefit or this benefit will help you save on your deductible. What we've got to do is start further back, I think, and talk about financial education because we're dealing with people who are really looking at how to pay for day-to-day -day expenses. And then we swoop in once a year and we talk about saving for the future. You know, we've got to help people understand what they have to deal with today and how they can make these good choices for their future and still be able to have a good today. Well, so right now we're in the middle of this discussion about mental wellness and mental health. Right. And I think it's a great opportunity because the research does indicate that even when someone is physically well, their big problems now are mental well-being and emotional well-being. And if we can make the tie to what's keeping you up at night is you know, money, and if we can make the case that you will be better as a result of this physically as well, if we can, we're going to get somewhere. So right now there's this groundswell. We just had Michael Phelps, you were with us in Las Vegas at our SHRM annual conference. Michael Phelps it was talking about mental and emotional stress. Mm. If we can tie that to financial stress, we can go a long way to make this kind of relevant right now. I actually want to piggyback on that because when it comes to financial planning and HSA, HSAs as well, there are a lot of unfamiliar terms. We're talking HSA, IRA, Roth, 401k. It's like, what is this letter and number jumble? And what does it mean for me? And so I think what you need to do to get people to engage with that is take a step back and paint the picture about why. What is the why that is going to keep me connected when I encounter a term I don't know so that I don't disengage, but that I ask more questions? What is the value I am going to get from engaging in this conversation that's going to make me sleep better at night, that's going to support my family and my children? It has to be connected to a bigger picture and a bigger feeling because what happens, again with the paperwork, again with the terms and the jargon, is it's so overwhelming, I can't even begin to process what this means, and so it goes on the back burner again and again and again. Whereas if you say, if this, then I sleep better, then my kids are okay, then I get to go on vacation next year, oh, I'm going to do some work for that. That's right. More money in my pocket. I love that alphabet soup. Like, if you're not a lawyer, you don't. It's an IRA, a Roth IRA, a 401k, and God forbid you're in a nonprofit organization, it's called a 403b. You know, you don't even know what, they, I mean, they're just throwing out all these terms that, that really don't translate to the average employee. Yeah. So that's one of the innovations that we're seeing. I actually have seen companies start to say, we're just gonna use our own language, right? People understand pension, they kind of get that concept, mm -hmm. but we're gonna break this down into in words that people actually use to live their lives. I actually love that because one of my tools when people are struggling to save is to name your bank accounts. Yes. And so you can name your HSA account and be like, Stephanie is going to be a <laughs> fabulous 70 year old traveling the world and eating cheese because she's so healthy account. Well, you yeah. know, it's funny that you mentioned it. So my grandmother, back in the day, I remembered her, they'd have layaway plans or where they'd save all year long, or they'd have their Christmas plan, where out of your check you'd take 20 bucks so that you got to the end of the year, you could provide for Christmas kids, for, you know, gifts for your family. So just making this by name an account that serves a purpose that means something to you will go a long way. I love that. I think a lot of people do that. I do that. I name all my accounts, so apparently I'm doing something right around here. <laughs> But do you think the average person understands that while they're saving for Christmas or they might name an account after their child so their child has money for the future, do you think enough people save for health, for future health care? No, they don't. <laughs> is the answer. <laughs> that no. is the answer. We have all kind of, it's not necessarily a generational issue. I think in today's world where we're able to get instant answers on Google or we're able to get anything we want delivered to our house within a day, 
um, we tend to have lost that long-term thinking. So again, it's back to a kind of an education of you want to be able to have the same quality of life 10 years from now, 20 years from now, that you feel like you do today. Or if you don't feel like your quality of life is what you want, what are you doing each step along the way to make it better and to continue that momentum? So it's, it's really re-educating people on a long-term approach because we're all victim to the I want it now. Your team is up perfectly because we've talked so much about all the things that Americans are stressed about, all the things that employees are stressed about, and you're talking about long-term saving, right? And so I think about, you know, when we were sitting down and we were talking about all these stressful things that employees face, we're like, you could literally build a wall of all the concerns and all the worries that employees face. And so, Eric, I That's hate to do cue. this to you. I'm going to go out in the rain. But I you're going to go this. out in the rain. Eric is going to go through some of the worries that employees face, and I volunteered him as tribute. To so yeah. he's going to tee up some questions for you guys and see if you can help us figure out how to solve these. Things. So again, these are worries that people have when it comes to benefits. And so I'm going to randomly choose some of these, uh, and we'll, we'll go ahead and grab one here. All right. Stephanie, I'm going to pick on you with this one, OK? It's all about high deductibles, OK? So the deductible for my health insurance is $2,000. How can I support employees uncovering that? So if you're offering a high deductible health plan, the first thing I would just do is make sure it's HSA eligible. And if it is, let people know that. And then don't just say, hey, by the way, you have a high deductible health plan that's HSA eligible because that's more of that jargon I was talking about before. Well, what does that mean? Well, what it means is you can use those pre-tax dollars to save for your medical expenses both now and in the future. So we were talking before about how it's hard to have long-term thinking. Well, one of the reasons it's really hard to have long-term thinking is because there are so many demands on our money in the present. And one of the things that an HSA allows you to do that I really struggle to think that of different accounts that allow you to do this is save in a tax-advantaged way, like a retirement account, while still being able to tap into that account when you need it for qualifying expenses. Usually with a retirement account, you get a penalty if you tap into it before you're age 59 and a half. With an HSA, I'm saving for those medical expenses. I'm getting that huge tax advantage, triple tax advantage when I contribute, when the money grows, and when I withdraw. And it's flexible so that if I have a problem tomorrow, I can use it and I don't have to, I can use that money to, until I meet my deductible to bring down some of that cost as well. If I could add, you know, one of the things we do is a lot of uh, storytelling. Storytelling matters, right? And so what I've found, especially with these high deductible plans, is if you sit down with an employee and say, how would you feel in February of this year? Year just starts and your six-year-old gets sick and you can't afford the copay you can't afford the prescription. So you take the kid to the doctor, and then the doctor says, this is the prescription she needs, and you can't provide it. How does that make you feel? So what if we could provide you an option to ensure that you can provide for your kid? They don't care about the labels then, because now you're actually talking about something that means something to them. So it's really making this practical for people. Uh, Johnny, this one's for you because you already mentioned this at the beginning of, of the podcast here, and we talked about retention, right? We talked about the great resignation. Specifically, how can an HSA help? So it's very simple. We've got to talk about it, and we've got to make sure that people value it. So we as HR folks know the value of it. The problem is so many of our employees don't know the value of it, and frankly, that's our failure. I think as a profession, we have to take time to educate people on it. Listen, even the name, a health savings account, like even it's not particularly attractive. <laughs> so what we've got to do, it's not sexy, I signed up for my HSA, but what we've got to do is bring this down so that people understand the value of it. And then I actually think it will help us retain people. You know, most people understand their 401k conceptually, right? I put money in it, there's a match to it. Uh, you know, I roll it over and over time I'm going to be able to retire. They don't understand the mechanics of an HSA. And when we do that, I think we'll see a direct correlation to retention. That's great. I love that. Love that. Um, when I read this one, Jennifer, something that we talked about briefly, but something everyone worries about is unexpected medical bills, right? Like, it's just something that 
you try to plan for, but you don't really know until it happens. You're like, do I have the dollars to cover this? And so the big thing about this is you never know when a healthcare is needed, big or small. How can an HSA help you prepare for potentially larger costs that might be down the road? Well, Johnny actually kind of stole my little uh, <laughs> storytelling tidbit that I was thinking. I think it comes down to storytelling. Maybe sharing actual examples, even if you anonymize them or if you have personal experience, and help people see what the real benefit can be. And I can use myself as an example. I've had an HSA account for years because I have a very, I don't know if there's a very high deductible health plan, but I've got one because I'm typically very healthy. And a couple of years ago, I uh, had an accident riding my horse. She left me in the field for dead. Uh, <laughs> ended up in the emergency room for the first time in my life. So I, again, I'm a normally healthy person. I have this high deductible health plan. And I'm no different than anyone else sitting there in the emergency room thinking, how much is this going to cost me? And then I remembered, I have these few thousand dollars that over years have, have accumulated in my health savings account. And so it was really, really nice to be able to give that little debit card to pay the bill. And that really made me feel a whole lot better in a time where if I had had to deal with my injuries in addition to how am I going to pay for this, it would have been a much more stressful time. So what stories can you pull either from people you know or you can use my story, happy to share that, um, <laughs> but help people see that it's really that you're selling peace of mind. You're really selling the opportunity, just like investing for your retirement. We've almost convinced people that that's worthwhile in doing, but investing in your future health and well-being is something that you can also position with HSAs. I was just going to add that HSAs actually have the advantage of years of people talking about 401ks, right? Because you can invest the money that's in the HSA. And we've been trying to sell the value of compound interest to people in their 20s and 30s. And what happens if you contribute a couple hundred bucks a month over all of these years? Well, what does that mean when you get to be retirement age? We can use that same language in HSA land. So I think the story presents the idea. And then when we introduce the language and the jargon and we have people hopefully asking more questions, we bring it home by using the numbers and the potential of investment growth to really sell them on taking the action. I also think that one of the, in this storytelling, use the most practical examples. So I was literally talking with my, one of my employees who didn't participate in our HSA. And I described to them, I've got Invisalign. You all can't see it, but I do. That's why it's called Invisalign, right? And I said, let me just tell you how much less expensive these are by virtue of me having paid for them in advance by contributing to my HSA. Nice. And just doing basic math. You don't yep. have to like have an MBA from Harvard to get it. They're like, oh, so that $5,000 bill is actually only about $4,000, and they got it instantly. And I said, so if you have kids, they're likely to need braces. If you have someone old, my, old like me, you're going to need braces. So this gives you an opportunity to actually make it real to employees. So I think you know, just sharing your, your stories goes a long way. Yeah, that's great. I love these examples, and they're really good tangible ones, I think, for all the HR pros listening um, that really they can use, again, in their back pocket when they're trying to explain the value of these. Stephanie, I'll, this, is a, this is a financial uh, question, so I'm going to go to our financial expert. And it's, uh, of course, around retirement needs, right? Uh, something we all think about eventually at some point in our career. Only 16%! What of employers believe employees are saving enough for their retirement? So what else can we do to help them? So a number of things. The thing is, by offering an HSA, not only do you give people a chance to potentially save and max out uh, the 401k contribution, but HSA has its own limit. So you can add another $3,600 in 2021 per individual that they can square away for their health care needs in retirement or if something comes up sooner, sooner. And because you can invest that money, you can really see some real growth potential. I've been investing for 10 years, and it's been a good 10 years to be investing in the stock market, let me tell you. And I got a lot of money in there. So I think really painting the picture around what it affords you, showcasing the opportunity, and letting people know that they can do this automatically 
is really valuable because this is one of the other things I don't think employers talk about enough is the value of automating things. The fact that you get a paycheck and your employer already takes that taxes out for you, that's one less thing you have to do on your to-do list. The fact that your employer will take your 401k contribution out every week for you after you set up the paperwork that one time, that's amazing. Same thing with the HSA. Automation makes people have good financial habits, and this has been scientifically proven, I'm not just saying it, and it's a huge stress relief. As somebody who owns a business, I gotta be looking this stuff up all the time, filing my quarterly taxes, finding my own retirement accounts. It's a real pain in the butt. So I think part of this is really just saying, this is an infrastructure of support that we are providing, and this is our commitment to you, not just in a paycheck, but in your full financial health and future. So we did some Sherm research to this point, and it was funny. People typically, surprisingly, most people can't tell you what they make per year. They can tell you what they bring home I might be per one every two people. weeks. That's it. They know. So if you ask them, like, how much money? I don't know. Maybe when you first take a job, you know, oh, I've got a job for 50 grand, blah, blah, blah. But the average person only knows what they bring home. So if we can educate them, quick, like, take it out so they get used to living on, living on whatever that number is, that will go a long way. So that automation point is really compelling. It yeah, is, especially good. when you think about, you know, the situation that you talked about, Jennifer, where all of a sudden you found yourself with those unexpected medical bills, then you have this little safety nets, right, like, stored away. And contributing $100 a month, not even missing it for years, and it was there when I needed it. Yeah. And the day you log into that account and check that balance, that's a sweet, sweet you day. <laughs> it is, it is. We'll do one more question from the worry wall, um, and this is all about stretching the buck. Right? How far can we stretch a dollar? Right? Employees want to be smart with their hard-earned monies, right? the $100. So any suggestions on how they can get more for the money they do earn? Question for any of you. I feel like I'm going to just reiterate a couple things. One is automation goes a really long way. Two, the reason people are obsessed with their retirement accounts is the tax advantage. right? The HSA offers a triple tax advantage. It is offering you that when you put the money in, it is offering you that when you take the money out, and it is offering you that on the earnings that the money has when it's in the account. The value of that on your bottom line over the course of a career, I mean, this is tens of thousands of dollars potentially. So talk about maximizing money. Let's talk real numbers. That's maximizing money. And it's very similar. I mean, as HR leaders, we're not supposed to give financial advice when we're talking to people about 401ks, right? So we all have ways where we talk all around that to tell them why it's a good thing for them to do without giving financial advice. With HSAs, I think you can be a little bit more forthright. The example that Johnny gave about the, the Invisalign, the actual cost to you would be this. No one wants to give their money to the man, you know, to the government, to someone else sharing with them how it reduces their taxable income, how the earnings in the account is tax-free, how when you pay for something, there's no tax on that if you're using it for a qualified medical expense. So there are ways to get people excited about HSAs by really kind of speaking to the things that matter to them. And I would add on top of that, one of the things right now everyone's talking what we call IEND or DE&I, uh, what we really have an opportunity to do is to pitch this more broadly. We spend a lot of time talking to really educated people about benefits. There's a huge opportunity to speak to that employee who's making $10, $12, $15 an hour and really breaking this down for them. And that will help rise the tide for all Americans. So there's, a, you know, from a practical standpoint, we should also spend time working with people who just might, they're simply first generation or not making up enough money to otherwise save. And we just assume that we can use terms that appeal to all of us, right? And the average employee, the average American, really doesn't really understand that. So I think in this, couching it as a diversity, equity, and inclusion message for women, for underrepresented minorities, for new immigrants to this country, there's an opportunity to say, this is bigger than just you know, money. This is about the American dream. And this is going to help you live it and experience it in ways that you might not otherwise think about. It's such a great point, and it brings back me back to something we talked about a little while ago, and that's that we're using terms and jargon that people don't understand. And 
you know, you brought up earlier that HSA is probably not the sexiest term to use. <laughs> and I, that brings me to an, a high deductible health plan, you know, or an HSA eligible health plan. Are there ways that we can help break down that barrier? Because when you hear the term high deductible, it doesn't really scream, enroll in me. <laughs> so is there, is there a way that we can break that down for employees where maybe they do want to enroll in it? Yeah, we joke that the government should never be able to allow to never. market or brand any anything. Well, <laughs> I think especially there with high deductible health plans, with HSAs, with all these deductions that people are seeing, well, that's going to all come out of my paycheck. But there's a reason why I and maybe some others chose a high deductible health plan. You're rolling the dice and saying, I'm typically very healthy. I would rather have less money taken out of my paycheck for the monthly deduction and have more money to take home. So whether you're talking about these high deductible health plans or HSAs, it really is, to, to Johnny's point earlier, they're focused on what is it that I'm going to take home every week or every month. How am I going to be able to pay my actual bills that I know what they are, and I need to make sure that I maximize that. So really helping people to see the value of what their choices allow them to end up with in terms of their take-home pay. I don't know what we call them. But you know, high deductible auto automatically sounds unappealing. Mm -hmm. uh, health savings account sounds like, well, I'd rather just take it myself and theoretically put it in the bank, which yeah. we know we never will. So how can we get people to make good decisions up front that ultimately is going to maximize their take home pay? And I think that's where the story lies. You know what? We need to make a pact that everybody today, we're no longer going to call it a high deductible health plan. <laughs> it's not allowed. Now on all of our open enrollment materials, we're calling it an HSA eligible health plan. Ooh, I well, like that. I love it, I love it. But I tell you, I'm gonna go back to something I said in the beginning, and that is we're gonna to have to go a little old school. I actually think there's gonna be a huge value in pe making people slow down and sit through an orientation again. I mean, you gotta figure, that's really what we're, 401Ks, that's not a particularly attractive name either, but everyone embraced it over time because you used to have to go sit down and hear it from HR, whether you wanted to hear it or not, and then a human being could give it context and explain. It's much harder, we can gamify it, we can storytell online, but there is nothing, I mean, listen, the problem is so many people are multitasking. So you let them do this online, and they're just trying to get through it. I mean, I, I was, I'm a lawyer, so I go through this training session the other day, and I'm cheating for my bar credits, right? I just turned it on, and I watched television. I was doing other things, right? I just wanted to get through it. And you don't do that for Sherm credits. <laughs> you don't do that at all. But the idea is we have got to force people to focus. If this is as important as we say it is, there is something to be said for making people focus on this. Good. Um, as we start to kind of wrap up our conversation, one thing that I really want to make sure and point out is um, one of the huge values of an HSA specifically is planning for retirement. And again, pulling numbers here, it's projected that an average couple household, right, a healthy one at 65 year old, the healthcare expenses are going to be $351,000 in today's dollars or $535,000. Think about how much money that is in healthcare costs. And I think I would love to hear your perspective, Stephanie, on how an HSA, when people are at this stage of their life, I know that everyone's gonna be thinking about retirement, right? We're talking to a certain group of people here and that's totally cool, right? But for those who are in that frame of mind and are thinking about retiring, how can we really be clearly and understand how much healthcare expenses we're going to have and how far HSA dollars could go for them? So it's a bit of a double-edged sword here because you throw out a number like $350,000, that's an enormous number. And somebody might take that as, that's a huge number, I better start saving. But you know what a lot of people do? They say, there is no hope for me. There is no way I will ever be able to do that. And so I think you have to break it down into a singular next step. And the first thing I tell people to do, and you'll love to hear this, or maybe not, is go talk to your HR professional. <laughs> because anybody can set up a meeting with HR not everybody feels like they can save $350,000. And so for me, it's always one step at a time and using the why to connect and motivate people when there starts to be those moments of pushback and self-doubt and overwhelm to keep going. Something that we've done and we've seen quite, you said, you said give me some ideas and then I said I had none and now I'm telling you a couple of them. But, <laughs> So companies are now capturing stories of their employees. So when an employee experiences an unexpected emergency, the car accident, 
the kid who is diagnosed with cancer. They have gone to employees and said, you know, no force, but would you mind telling that story in video? And then they distribute it to the employees, not for a sympathy moment, but for an education moment to say, you know, if only this person had $15,000 in the bank or in their HSA bank, then they would be in so much better of a position. So having them hear from their own colleagues or people like me mm -hmm. really, really sells. I mean, you got an expert like Stephanie, you have me as an HR, you got Jennifer disrupting everything, but there's nothing like the person who sits next to you in the cube next to you saying, this happened to me. And either I had an HSA and this is how it worked out, or I didn't and this is how it worked out. Really powerful. And we try to do that on our HSA Day page. We have stories from people who are just users of HSAs, whether it's the person that's using their dollars to spend for their yearly medical expenses, whether it's an individual that's saving for that, that unexpected large, or those that are have enough money where they can just keep putting all their HSA dollars for retirement because they know they're needed there. And that's the beauty of HSAs, is you can use it for every scenario, and it's just shining a light on that. Well, I think, um, wow. Our audience has thinned out a little bit with a little bit of downpour. I'm so proud of those <laughs> folks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, shout out, shout out, shout uh, out. Well, thank you so much. This has been such a good conversation. I'm so excited to share everything that we've talked about with the world uh, around HSAs, around the HR environment that we live. Such good thoughts. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the podcast. This is definitely, you lived up to the epic term, didn't it? It did, I mean, the rain really, <laughs> really <laughs> helped. The rain was epic too. Thank you so much. We appreciate the show, and thanks for tuning in, everyone, to their Thank episode you. of Benefits Buzz.